to our fourth session of Serum Seminar for this season. This evening is our always interesting and popular members night. So we're starting off with Larry Jones on Vizile. It will be followed by Dick Jones on the Lincoln, Lincoln Cathedral's Miss. We'll have our quick break. And when we come back, Linda Papanakalo will give us part two of her talk on the forms of medieval poetry. You'll remember last member's night a year ago, she gave us part one and I have good news for you. Next, probably coming this December, she will give us part three. All right, Larry, you're first. Again, good evening. My name is Larry Jones. My wife is Patricia. I would like to introduce us and tell you how we became such lovers of medieval art and architecture. I was born on the panhandle of Florida and I'm proud to say I'm a swamp rat. On the weekends, my dad would take my brother and I out in the swamps to play. If any of you have any problems with gators or rattlesnakes, just give me a call. Don't believe me? Check out this sign. This is where I grew up. It's easy to look down on this part of the country, but don't forget we gave you Truman Capote, Tennessee Williams, William Faulkner, Harper Lee, not to mention jazz and blues. I eventually graduated from the University of Florida with a degree in electrical engineering. All right, so there's the sign. That's a real sign, by the way. I'm not making that up. Um, my uh, Patricia, my wife, is a farm girl. She grew up in central Minnesota on our family farm, which is home city of our German grandfather. She was only five foot two, but used to drive a tractor, milk the cows, feed the pigs. She went to a one room schoolhouse that required her to walk about a hundred yards from the farmhouse to the highway each morning to catch the school bus. Remember that sometimes it was 20 to 30 degrees below zero. It's hard to imagine an eight year old standing at the edge of the highway waiting for a school bus. Eventually she graduated from University of Minnesota. I know what you're thinking, how did a Florida swamp rat meet a Minnesota farm girl? I mean, rural Minnesota is the last place I would look for the perfect woman. Fortunately, we both loved travel, had some jobs, saved our money for a student tour of Europe. We met on Marken Island near Amsterdam. We eventually got married and ended up in California where Patricia got her MBA from Stanford and while there took an elective course in medieval art and architecture. How she picked this course, I'll never know, but it changed our lives. After she graduated, we took a trip to France with her textbook in hand, to see all those wonderful works of art. Our best visit was Vaisele, and some of you may have noticed my license plate is Vaisele, so I would like to take you there. First fly to Paris with your Michelin maps and red guide, rent a car and head south. Do not drive through Paris, but rather take the ring road around it. I used to drive in Paris, but I've given it up. Soon you will be in Burgundy, the real France. You will pass Chablis, and if you want unlimited free wine tasting, this is a place for you. If I might digress, I'll tell you a very French story. Pat is an artist, and a few years ago, we were in Chablis, in the Chablis Vineyard with Pat working on a landscape painting. The vineyard owner uh, was there pruning each vine by hand. He came by and said Pat's painting was very beautiful. I said that his vineyard was beautiful. No, he said, it's hard work. Continue south until you get to Avalon and then exit west. You will be in green rolling hills with small villages, farms, and vineyards. Eventually, you will see Vaisley perched on the hill. On top is the church. We can recommend two hotels, the Hotel Line d'Or in Vaisele or the Chateau de Vaux Blundi, look at in the countryside near Vaisele. This is the uh, Chateau Vaux de, de Lundi. Um, it's surrounded by a medieval wall and moat, but the, um, the hotel itself is a, is a chateau. Um, we stayed there once and the doorman asked if we had met the dog. No, we hadn't, so he introduced us to a mangy mutt. When we checked into the desk, the clerk asked if we had met the dog. 
Yes, we met the stupid dog. We had a delightful way of walking around the grounds and finished with a perfect French dinner. The next morning, we were having a beautiful French breakfast when people began murmuring the dog was coming. In it came soaking wet cake with mud and ran round and round the restaurant getting everything dirty and wet. Then we found out about the dog. In came a man with two handfuls of truffles. It was a truffle dog. Some people use pigs to hunt truffles, but dogs will but pigs like to eat them. Dogs just hunt them. Uh, the other hotel is this one, the Line d'Or. It's located at the base of the hill where both where Vesley is. They have some beautiful rooms looking to Burgundy countryside. Once we had a room with a bath larger than the bedroom. It had a clawfoot bathtub that had a stunning view of Burgundy. Uh, park in the municipal parking lot uh, and leave one of these in your dash. It tells the police that you not over, over park. Once you checked in the hotel, you can use their parking lot. You can drive to the top of the hill and park next to the church, but I would highly recommend walking. So it's time to start walking to the church at the top of the hill. Just take the central winding streets and enjoy the shops and cafes along the way. You might like to do what Pat and I do at least once on every French trip. Try to find a small cafe with a 15 euro lunch. Years ago, we had a four course lunch with all the wine we could drink for 12 euros. We drank the bottle and they promptly brought another. We didn't want to be ugly Americans, so we drank as much as we could of the second bottle. The street is winding, so you can't see the church until you're almost there. And here it is. The church is unusual in that the right front and back front have a bell tower and the left side does not. On the right of the church is a monastery. The church may seem plain, but this is Romanist architecture, not Gothic. The, the Templum is a classic scene with Jesus in the center directing sinners to hell and the saved to heaven. While many churches have the same temperament, none are better than this. In most cases, we don't know who the artists were who created these wonderful works. It seems they were considered merely artisans, especially in later Gothic works. But in Vesley and other Romanesque works, we do see individual expression. An artist named Gil Soberis is believed to have been in charge. We know that he was in charge at Aton, which is the south of Vesley. Here are uh, two of his works. One is of Eve stealing the forbidden apple. Eve is shown flying through the air while grabbing the apple as an afterthought. She doesn't seem the least bit worried. In fact, she has a smile on her face. This is another classic scene, the flight into Egypt. Um, Mary and the baby Jesus are on the donkey. Uh, Joseph is leading the way. But Look at the base, they're all on wheels. It gives you a sense of motion. It brings a smile to your face. Individual expression is seen in other religious monuments around the world. I remember a painting we saw in a pyramid in Egypt as of a small orchestra, but all the musicians were animals. Clearly, the Pharaoh didn't dictate this plan painting for his tomb. After all, he was a god. We move in, there's a, another tympanum. Um, this, this is a scene of Jesus with his disciples. This is a classic, classic biblical scene, except Jesus is sitting down and he has his knees turned to the side and he looks very awkward. He also has a worried look on his face. I'm sorry, I don't have a better picture. He has a worried look on his face and his clothes all look like they're being blown by the wind. Very unusual. This is the main aisle of the church. Notice that the columns and arches are black and white stones. It's very, very effective, very dramatic. I think if this were in a Gothic church, it really wouldn't would be too much. But in this Romanesque church, it's perfect. Now you should do what uh, I always do when I'm in a, a French church. I just start wandering, just wander around. 
don't don't have any plan, just wander, wander, wander. This is a picture of a side aisle. You can see it's very Roman Romanesque, very plain. In the Middle Ages, the relics of the saints were unbelievably valuable. They were often bought and sold and sometimes stolen. Basile was lucky to have the reigns of Mary Magdalene, which drew pilgrims from all over France. Basile became the starting part for the famous pilgrimage to San Diego, San Diego de Compostela. Unfortunately, another church declined to have the real remains, and Basile went in decline. You will use, usually find the uh, remains under the altar. Here are the remains at Basile. Now go out the right side of the church and we'll see the mo monastery wander around and around and eventually we'll see the Burgundy countryside with all its vineyards, farms, rolling hills and small villages. That's the view through a vineyard looking at Basile. As you leave the church, there is a gift shop on your right. I know, I know, a gift shop, but it has some wonderful reproductions uh, of church art. Here is a carving we brought back. As you wander down the hill, you might want to stop and get a bottle of Magdalene, the local aperitif. There it is. On your way back to the outer road, you can take a leisurely drive along the river, the Curry. There's a beautiful hotel in the river. I would recommend a meal there overlooking the river. I've always had a special attraction to water. When I was growing up, if I closed my eyes, I could always hear the ocean waves. As a special treat, my dad, dad would take my brother and I out to the swamps to play. If I might quote the Russian movie director, Alexander Sukharov, who said this about the Nervy River in St. Petersburg, look, the sea is all around us. We're destined to sail forever. Thank you. Kathleen, ask Hello? Kathleen, ask your question. Okay. Yes? Ah, all right. I will ask my question. Have you ever been to a musical performance there? Yes, we have. We were there one time when there was a choir singing medieval uh, music. It was, it was just wonderful. We were extraordinarily lucky. We were on a canal trip on the Canal de Nivernay, and our stop one night pointed us to the fact that the night that we were laying over in this small village, an hour drive away, that night there was the Vienna State Choir and the Orchestra of uh, Burgundy doing the Messiah. Oh. <laughs> you and were really you ever, lucky. If you ever want the hair on the back of your neck standing up, get the Messiah at the transept of Vesele. I mean, it was <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> and we kept worrying because we thought the Messiah was two hours, two hours and 20 minutes at the you know, two and a half hour mark. We were only halfway through. So we took <laughs> our dear friend, Walter, and we said, what are we gonna do about the tax that we've hired? Walter said, don't worry, I hadn't paid him yet. He stayed with us until he drove us home at 1 a.m. But it, it was, <laughs> It was incredible, just unbelievable. Can I break in, Larry? This is Julia. Can you uh, stop, unshare your screen, turn that off so we can see the group? Oh. Um... Again, at the bottom, once you click to share the screen, click it again. Mm -hmm. There you go. Go to your right. There's nothing on my screen, but I'm going to my right. Very bottom. On mine it is. Can anybody help here? There's nothing on the bottom of my screen. You have some icons along the edge but of your I, screen. Yeah, I see the icon. 
There you oh, go. Okay, okay. Now, you know, at the bottom, I click on what? Thank you. Done. Okay. Kathleen had a question. Are you still there, Kathleen? Unmute. Okay. No, she didn't. She's taking her hand down. There it is. I took my hand down because it was about Virginia. Right. <laughs> I was trying to say, Virginia's trying to get your attention. No. That was a long time ago. Further questions of Larry? Okay, Evelyn, are you there? Yeah, I just unmuted myself. Then we can go on to, um, first of all, thank you, Larry. Yeah. Now we're all ready to go. Thank you, Larry. We can buy airplane tickets. Um, <laughs> so we're ready for Dick Jones now on, on Lincoln Cathedral. Dick, are you ready? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. If you share Let's your see. screen. Start video. Share screen. Uh, share. There you are. Yeah, and I can't see the PowerPoint. Okay. There's the PowerPoint. Slideshow. From beginning. Okay. Yeah, I... You seeing that? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Let me give an outline of the talk. Um, let's see if my little, yes. The problem with this talk is how high Lincoln's missing spire is and was it ever the tallest structure? And this little panel on the right is uh, over, my, over the top of that. How do I get the panel on the right to not be on the top of that? It's not showing on the top in my screen. Okay. Uh, fine. So I've uh, chosen a few random uh, <clears throat> labels for the parts of this talk. And we'll start with Genesis, which is the origin. The origin was 1994. But before that, I first visited Lincoln Cathedral in the summer of 1980 before I knew much about cathedrals. <clears throat> With an unlimited British rail pass, I traveled all over Britain from London as far as Canterbury, Penzance, and Aberdeen, <clears throat> trying for as many cathedrals as possible in two weeks. After a long hiatus, I began to learn more about cathedrals, starting with Bob Scott's Stanford Continuing Studies course SOC 20 in the spring of 1994, followed by SOC 21. I don't know what happened to 21. <clears throat> and then 20, uh, oh, that should have been 21. Now it's 26 in 1997. Um, <clears throat> as you will know, Bob Scott's courses and the associated field trips he and Julia Freeman led evolved into the Serum Seminar sponsoring this talk. Bob's 1997 SOC 26 course featured several people who helped me toward working on Lincoln Spire. Virginia Jansen, Bill Mart, George Brown, and Tim Tatton Brown. I was privileged to give one of the SOC 26 lectures, How Gothic Cathedrals Were Built, a demonstration of the principles and challenges. The advice and encouragement of Bob Scott on a topic, Virginia Jensen on getting a paper submitted and Bill Mart's gift of Stanford Library privileges resulted in research at the British Public Re Record Office near London during the April 1997 Serum Seminar UK trip organized by Bob and Julia which included a visit to Lincoln Cathedral. Then a lot of spreadsheet work resulted in my first real paper given in May 1998 at the annual Kalamazoo International Medieval, Medieval Congress, the IMS. Gleanings from the 1253 building accounts of Westminster Abbey, subsequently published in the Vista Forum Journal for fall winter 1988-99. A start, but nothing to do with spires yet. What nobody had told me <clears throat> was that the annual IMC in Kalamazoo, held just before Mother's Day, was where medievalists go in the spring to mate. 
<laughs> My wife was asked, um, you mean you let him go there by himself? <laughs> you may recall one amazing SOC 20 exhibit, a 12 foot long measured drawing of the scaffold in Salisbury Cathedral Spire. I presented a second paper in May 1999 at Kalamazoo's IMS on the weight of that scaffolding, having built a 12 foot long table to measure the drawn sizes of the scaffold's timbers to figure out its weight. You can just make out the triangular shape on the table. My work on spires had begun, but that paper wasn't published. Several papers dealing with Salisbury Spire followed. The medieval jigsaw puzzle for the ironwork, the Salisbury Spire scaffold debate, because it, we were debating seriously back and forth whether the scaffold inside the spire had been used to build it. Constructing Salisbury Cathedral Spire, my rebuttal on that subject, and then a little article about how you can lift things through all that scaffold if you want to. And finally, around some time there, Tim Tatton Brown poses the question of the height of Lincoln's missing spire. A one page timetable timeline and an expanded view show the dates of that spire. An exhibit in the cathedral models it. The current view of the central tower proves that the spire is definitely gone. Various publications assert various heights for the missing spire, but none of them cites a proper source. The 525 foot height and a variety of sources of widely varying credibility produce a timeline of the tallest structures between 1100 and 1900, which shows that Lincoln Spire was the tallest structure while it stood. In March 2017, Andrew Prescott of the University of Glasgow kindly provided additional references from as early as 1841. <clears throat> and in November 2018, Nigel Hiscock of Oxford added even more references from a comprehensive search of Oxford libraries. However, none of these additional sources proved to be original. The unsourced 525 foot assertion motivated a search for better documentation. Julie Wright, assistant librarian at the Cathedral Library, replied to an inquiry pro by providing the only snippet of documentation known. The key content is that the spire and stonework of the tower were equal. This Latin translation was by the another person at the cathedral and George Harden Brown checked it as well. <clears throat> Assuming the level of the nave floor as the lower boundary and the equality of the spire and stonework as exact, the height might be twice the height from which the spire springs. That is twice 225 feet or 450 feet. Or it might be twice the height of the tower's parapet, giving 479 and a half feet. Or it might even be twice the height of the tops of the leaden pinnacles, 530 and a half feet. Or higher if you lower the nave floor. Two thousand and seven to eight, where I was drafting a paper on this subject. And then I did a paper on Chartres South Spire, a Norwich Cathedral Spire, and you'll see a bunch of pictures from that later. And finally, I revisited the building accounts in 2013. As the documentation was not definitive, might the actual site retain any traces of the missing spire? Lincoln's Cathedral Lincoln Cathedral's archaeologist Philip Dixon braved health and safety regulations to arrange a July 19, 2008 expedition to the top of the tower for himself, consulting archaeologist Tim Tatton Brown and me. Ascending the central tower permits a view of its lead covered spirelets and their prohibited graffiti, the nave's lead roof, 
the cathedral situation atop a bluff and the central tower's present day lead roof. This is Philip Dixon, which bears on old timbers that presumably once supported a spire. Here's Tim Tatton Brown. No special evidence of the old spire was evident on this brief sojourn, but it certainly served to demonstrate how exposed the spire would have been to wind. A 1931 dimension drawing incident to repairs contains a section and plan of the present day top of this tower. This drawing provided a critical dimension for the model discussed later. Finally, in 2013, a preliminary paper was presented at Kalamazoo as a summary of a paper in preparation. Neither a firm estimate of height nor a source of the 525 foot height had been found, but the paper summarized at Kalamazoo had an extensive appendix setting out the mathematics of polygonal spires. This complete, completed the journey, at least to a preliminary paper, but I was unsatisfied with the weak conclusions. This section treats various rules and analyses which bear on the determination of height and its consequences. The height of a structure is a fuzzy figure. Nominally, it is the distance from its base to its top, but both the base and the top may, be, may vary. The internationally recognized Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitats, based at IIT in Chicago, now defines the base as the level of the lowest significant open air pedestrian entrance. Uh, we're not quite sure how that applies to the Great Pyramid, but okay. And the top in three flavors, architectural top, including spires, but not antennae, highest occupied floor and height to tip, including everything. The choice of top reorders the 10 tallest buildings, so it is not trivial. Further, it is not at all clear which flavor is being used in figures cited on the internet and elsewhere, <clears throat> and there are ample opportunities for fudging, particularly on sloping sites where a lower pedestrian entrance might be open to increase the height, as it was in Chicago for one building. Architectural height, preferable for these comparisons, is almost never explicitly said. Even these definitions are not precise. For example, exactly where is a spire's architectural top? Here is one ambiguity, even if it is minor. Another difficulty with the equal statement is that the position of the observer, which affects the result, is not given. For superposed elements of equal height, the upper element always subtends a smaller visual angle, but how much smaller depends on the structure and the observer's distance, calling into question any observation absent instruments and calculations. The missing spire stood for over 200 years before succumbing to a windstorm. What might this say about its height? Jacques Heyman's scheme of analysis provides some insight. It is a simplified model of opposing wind and weight forces acting on the spire. The forces act on lever arms, shown in red, and as on a teeter-totter, when the wind force times its arm is less than the weight force times its arm, the spire stands. Once the wind increases further, the spire is in tension and failure is incipient. This is also true for a quartering wind because the two arms increase proportionally. Working with this model results in four general rules here only summarized, but stability of a spire increases the more it weighs, it increases the bigger it is, it increases the more squat it is, everything else being equal, and for octagonal spires, the wind direction doesn't matter, at least in this simple model. Heyman's model can be applied at each level of a spire, which is exactly what was done for Norwich Cathedral in Spire in a 2012 paper. Here is the result, both symbolically and as a spreadsheet expression. Symbolically, boldface spreadsheet and not in boldface. And here is a plot of the result. The spire is lying on its side with its top at the left. 
you can see that a very light wind would topple the top, which is why a weight hangs from the top to produce a better result. This is a very common thing to find in spires because it's a problem with any spire. The top is much more vulnerable than the rest of it. The winds resisted are quite strong, which is why that spire still stands. The geometry of a spire is shown here to identify, to identify the angle alpha circled in red, which is the half angle of a spire's apex measured across the flats. Using the horizontal size and height of Lincoln's Tower, the alpha of a given height or the height of a given alpha is readily found. Here are some examples of from four to 10 degrees with 4.052 degrees being the alpha that will give a 525 foot total height. Several hypothetical spire structures were defined for evaluation by a method based on Heyman's five flavors of lead covered and one stone spire. You can see different uh, sizes of sheathing, different thicknesses of boards, uh, different weights of armature. <clears throat> These were evaluated only at the base of the spire for each of the preceding angles to, to find the wind velocity beyond which tension in the structure began. The results show tension for the lead spires at rather moderate wind speeds. The reason is they are simply not anything like as heavy as a stone spire. And as we saw earlier, heavier, heavier means more stable. However, the lead spire stood for a long time. So either the hypothetical structures are all too light or the wooden armature of the lead spires could accommodate tension better than stone. I'm finally forced to conclude that the true height of Lincoln Cathedral's missing spire is lost in the fog of history. This is not the result that I had hoped for, but no amount of technical manipulation serves to justify any particular height. It seems likely that the spire was once the tallest structure by at least some measure, but even that is not certain, especially St. Olaf might have been both contemporaneous and taller given its purported height only five feet shorter than Lincoln. Even old St. Paul's in London standing 489 feet from before Lincoln's spire was built to after Lincoln's spire's fall exceeds some of the heights implied by modern documentation for Lincoln's spire. It is currently impossible to prove this, but I have also come to believe that the 524 foot figure is a conflation with the length of the cathedral reported in, for example, Anderson in 1841. <clears throat> Other sources identified by Andrew Prescott and Nigel Hiscock may refute this belief, but after nearly two decades on this subject, I think I'll stop. My thanks to the many people who helped in this effort. Finally, if you visit Lincoln Cathedral, be sure to also see the nearby castle with one of the original Magna Carta copies sealed by King John on the 15th June 1215 and the astonishing Prisoner's Chapel built for the 19th century separate system jail designed to achieve penitence by never allowing its penitents to see another prisoner, truly a penitentiary. And of course, Brown's Pie Shop on Steep Hill is for the finest of steak and kidney pies. Bob, next question. Uh, yeah, uh, Dick, uh, uh, can you remind me of where the original figure of 524, do you know where that came from? Uh, there is a book by Anderson, uh, 1854, some, some 44 something. Um, and the figure is given as the length of the cathedral. It's in, oh. a it's in a table and the height of the spire is given there too. And if you add the height of the springing of the spire to that, it does not come to 525, right. I mean 425. It but uh, I, I think 
that's what I said. I think it's been conflated with the length. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Well, and then one other question. Are there any existing drawings of the cathedral that would be helpful in terms of trying to estimate the height that you're aware of? Um, well, there are drawings of the tower, and I, I have or have had some of them. But uh, when you start looking around the tower, there's nothing to see that I can see. Um, I have a little paper um, that a guy that's pretty familiar with the cathedral says that he can see an angle on the inside of the spirelets that indicates what the angle of, his, of the spire was, but I, I sure didn't see that. But, but I'm asking about a slightly different thing. Are there artistic drawings from a distance? Oh, yeah, there, there was something, it? yes. Um, yeah. There was a drawing, I think it's Holler, that, that drew a lot of things around England. And the drawing uh, shows a spire that's not that tall. Uh-huh. Is, is what I understand. I, yeah. have not, I have not personally seen the drawing. But it doesn't and, show a, a, a spire like that one in the model. Uh, you can see the model behind me on the background yeah. shot. Uh, and then one final question. Are there any existing accounts of the collapse? I don't know of anything other than that little note that said it was a huge storm. Wow. And, you know, for a, for a wooden spire, it's not going to take down the tower with it necessarily. Likely not. Yeah, yeah. So it's, you know, you lose the spire and, you know, we lost the bumper on the car. Too bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for that talk, Dick. That was really wonderful. Very, very interesting. Yeah, I don't have a question. I just want to say don't give up because they think 20 years is not enough. You just need a bit more time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I haven't got that much time. Where's <laughs> Joe? I, I just realized I'm in my ninth decade. Um, Liz, do you want to ask a question? Um, I'm just, um, I'm Dick's daughter. Hello. And, hi, nice to meet all of you. And I'm just happy to hear that he's moving on. <laughs> <laughs> you mean for, because of the inheritance? Uh, no. <laughs> Any, other questions? <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Thank you, Evelyn. Um, uh, we're, we're going to take a seven minute break now, five, seven minutes. Okay. We come back and it will be Linda. So everybody take a quick little break. So Linda, are you ready? Un unmute yourself. Yeah, unmute. Okay. Yeah, I am ready. Um, what I've got is... Uh, I pre-recorded my talk because uh, the few conferences I've been at recently have uh, been asking it. And so that's just the way I do things now. And so when I go into the share screen, it's uh, I'll, it'll get going and it will run. And it's just a tad under 15 minutes. And uh, just but I have some a, a sentence or two to add at the end. So I did not go back and change the last slide. So let me go in and get the share screen done. Okay, and let's see. Yeah, all right. And let me, let's see. All right. All right, ready to go. Let's see if this works. Hold on. Survivals and Revivals of Medieval Poetry, part two. Going Global with Islamic Verse Forms. My talk last year was on the form fix in 12th to 15th century French poetry that included Rondeau, Ballade, Virelay, as taken up by English language poets in the 19th and 20th century. This year, I'm continuing it, but going global Middle Ages with medieval Persian poetic forms that have been taken into English language poetry specifically the Rubaiyat and Guzzle. The format will be similar to last year's, though the questions posed by this kind of 
uh, cultural appropriation are considerably different. Uh, one is how do the choices made by the translators color the responses of modern poets and readers? Another is uh, what about heritage? What part do Orientalism, cultural appropriation, and the so-called white gaze play in English language adoptions of Islamic poetic forms? These issues were not present in my talk last year because we were within the context of European poetry, but this year uh, it is definitely there, particularly in the first poetic form I'm going to show you, which is the Rubaiyat. The Persian Rubai singular is a quatrain of A-A-B-A -A -A or A-A-A-A rhyme scheme. The origin of the form is credited to a 10th century common era poet from Mosul in present-day Iraq, whose name was Abdul Hassan Rodeki. The best known rubayat, that's the plural for the collection of verses, the best known in the West is the rubayat of Omar Khayyam. It's an English translation by Edward Fitzgerald in 1859. Fitzgerald was a friend of Alfred Lord Tennyson's. He was a linguist and a poet in his own right. And he based his Rubaiyat translation on a manuscript in the Bodleian Library in Oxford, which was made in Shiraz in modern day Iran in 1460. The poem in translation was immensely popular by the 1880s. Clubs were devoted to it. Now, Omar Khayyam, Umar Khayyam, uh, from the 11th and 12th century, had been a mathematician and astronomer known to have written poetry, but Fitzgerald's Rubaiyat includes verses that may actually post-date the poet's death. So Kayyam is now considered an elusive figure. I've even seen it written that he should be struck from the list of Persian poets. The, his appeal in the West is perceived as that astronomer sciences, scientific, even anti-religious views, which they refer to as the skepticism versus Sufism debate. So right away here, we are plunged into a little bit of white gaze and cultural appropriation because uh, of an effort really to separate him from the Islamic context in which the poems were originally created. It's difficult to find poems in Rubaiyat form in English because Fitzgerald and his Omar so swamp your browser, but the most famous example is Robert Frost's Stopping by Woods. I learned this poem in school and no one ever told me that it was a Rubaiyat, but it is. The meter is iambic tetrameter rather than Fitzgerald's pentameter, but the rhyme scheme is AAB a, B, B, C, B, C, C, D, C, and then a D, 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 D. So you can see it. No, though, here, snow, queer, near, lake, year, shake, mistake, sweep, flake, deep, keep, sleep, sleep. And that's pure Fitzgerald. The second form I'll show you is Guzzle. Its history in English language poetry is more complex. The name translates roughly as conversations with women as the poem form often deals with loss and romantic love as a theme. Its origins lie in seventh century Arabic poetry though a distinct Persian form had developed by the late 9th century. And that's the one that spread widely. It's associated with the 13th century Sufi mystic Rumi and the 14th century Hafez. 
Persian Ghazal spread to India, West Africa, Islamic Spain. It's written in Turkic, Urdu, and in Hebrew. The form is fairly simple, clear, and although it evolved over time, it's pretty consistent. It is a series of couplets called share. Each couplet, your share, functions as a poem in itself. They, the analogy has been to jewels on a necklace. You appreciate each one and the way they're put together. The first couplet is the matla, which establishes the kafia or the rhyme scheme by signaling a redif or kind of a refrain at the end of each line. That word refrain is then repeated in each subsequent share, and then finally there's a makta, which is a separate self-referential verse at the end that names the poet and ties the poem together. The poem scheme can be summed up as A A B A C A D A E A, like that. The poetry of Hafez was already known in Europe in the 19th century. Goethe translated him into German and wrote Gussels himself, as did other German linguists poets. An influence can also be detected in English romantic poetry, but there is a huge difference because Gussel is a public performance poetry. This Gussel of Hafez can be used to demonstrate how that worked. In performance, the poet would read the matla, the opening couplet, which signals the radif to the audience that it would be fasts over, pass over. With subsequent couplets, the poet reads to engage the audience, keep them on the edge of their chair and keep them appreciating or even cheering the poem as each verse unrolls. And he can do this by repeating lines. It's time to say prayers we've long forgotten. It's time to say prayers we've long forgotten. So that ramps up expectations in the audience. They know that something rhymed with passed over is going to come in the second line, but how's the poet going to get there? How's he going to resolve the verse? It's time to say prayers we've long forgotten. Thank God the break from wine at last is over. So this continues through the poem and then you get thematic development, though each couplet stands alone. The poem does develop and it works eventually towards this self-referential verse at the end. Don't try to lead Hafez down the hard path. He's discovered wine. The hard path's over. Gussell entered American poetry in 1968. 1969 was the centenary of the death of Persian Urdu master poet Mirza Ghalib, Ajaz Ahmad, a Pakistani critic living in New York, organized a project to honor Ghalib, not only by translating his poems, but by inviting contemporary American poets to engage with them. Ahmad provided literal translations and lexical notes to these invitees, but left them creative freedom, including the freedom not to stick with Guzzle structure, but to use free verse if they preferred. One who responded was Adrian Rich. What attracted her was the fractured feeling of Guzzle's verse structure. Other poets, including Robert Bly, began to write what they called guzzles also. This is one of Rich's guzzles for the Ghalib collection. And it is an interesting and lovely poem. Remember what was going on in the not late 1960s, particularly 1968. Vietnam War, anti-war movement, political assassinations, moon landing, all of this found its way into the poem. The question is, is a poem that consists of free verse couplets 
a guzzle just because the author says it is. A better understanding of guzzle for American poetry had to wait until a later in the 20th century when the grip of free verse began to loosen. This was largely due to the efforts of Kashmiri American poet Aga Shahid Ali, who had studied in Indian and American universities, had family and personal connections with Urdu musicians and Ghazal writers, and knew what the real thing was. Here is one of his, written in May 2001. He died of brain cancer that December, which explains the sense of mortality that hangs so heavily and expressively on the poem. All this is part of an ongoing project, but at this point, I probably should pause and draw some tentative conclusions, at least about medieval Persian poetry forms as they came into English language uh, poetry. The two I've looked at, Rubaiyat and Ghazal, came to us, or rather were taken by us, at different times and through different routes and to different degrees, but both have proven their validity as English language poetry forms. The Rubaiyat, at the very least, for that Robert Frost poem that is now in all of our textbooks, and Guzzel for the many poets who, thanks in large part to the work of Aga Shahid Ali, now practice Guzzel. If you look at certain online sites, particularly the Guzzel page of the Poetry Foundation, you will see a lot of really nice Guzzels, and most particularly the African-American writers who have really made Guzzel their own. I think it's a combination of the performative aspect, slam poetry meets hip hop. The one I'm going to leave you with is this by Natasha Trethaway, who was Poet Laureate 12, 12, uh, 2012 to 2013. Miscegenation. In 1965, my parents broke two laws of Mississippi. They went to Ohio to marry, returned to Mississippi. They crossed the river into Cincinnati, a city whose name begins with a sound like sin, the sound of wrong, miss in Mississippi. A year later, they moved to Canada, followed a route the same as slaves, the train slicing the white glaze of winter, leaving Mississippi. Faulkner's Joe Christmas was born in winter, like Jesus, given his name for the day he was left at the orphanage, his race unknown in Mississippi. My father was reading War and Peace when he gave me my name. I was born near Easter, 1966, in Mississippi. When I turned 33, my father said, it's your Jesus year. You're the same age he was when he died. It was spring, the hills green in Mississippi. I know more than Joe Christmas did. Natasha is a Russian name, though I'm not. It means Christmas child, even in Mississippi. Okay, so just, I'm not sure I can get back to. It means. Uh, it's not going to show me spring. the. Uh, the hills the, green. Okay, it's not going to give me that slide again. Uh, just regarding that one last poem, um, and I did not uh, feel that I had enough time clean to re-record the last slide. One thing I did do, I'm afraid I misspelled her name. It's Trethaway Eway. Uh, uh, EY, but um, I got more information on that poet from watching Christiane Amapur um, a little over a week ago because she uh, did an interview with this woman. If you noticed the very heavy, I mean, the heaviness in that poem, uh, 
it's this is for me this is really interesting a test of a poem of poetic form is if it is is a vessel to which contemporary people can put their ideas in and i think she's really done that with the guzzle and uh, there's a great sadness in it and i was sort of sensing it and then i learned in that interview that in fact that canadian poet father of hers and the mother who was an african-american woman in mississippi uh, they divorced when natasha was about i think six years old her mother married another man down in Mississippi, uh, he was violent, he was an abuser, and he murdered her mother when she was 19. And the man's name was Joel, evidently the nickname Big Joe. So that's, a, I think, another layer of how Faulkner's Joe Christmas got in there. Uh, but it's, a, it's, a, when, it's one of these things when you know the biography, oh my God, the poem is pretty amazing, and it gains layers. So anyway, to my mind, uh, when I learned guzzles uh, when I took a, an NEH poetry seminar, and I didn't really appreciate them then, but it's a medieval poem, Persian form, and it is <coughs> alive and well today. So thank you very much. Thank you, Linda. We have questions and comments. Virginia? Uh, Linda, uh, do you write guzzles? I have. Um, in fact, uh, I've managed to publish them. I, that's part that I cut out. I decided with so many good, uh, really superlative pieces, uh, I wouldn't muscle in with my own. Uh, there was, a, there still is, it's, uh, it's no longer active. There was a guzzle page run by uh, a, a professor of poetry who was promoting it and, um, so he, they used to have challenges, and I went digging, and I found two of mine are actually there on the on the web. Well, yeah, I tried. I tried a rubaiyat, and it was a bear. I kind of like it, but what happens with that rhyme scheme of the rubaiyat is if you. I got it done. I thought, no, 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 it needs an extra verse in there. Well, if you want to change anything, it's <laughs> like you have to undo the entire poem and put it back together again with different rhymes at the end. And I thought, oh, this is no fun at all. No wonder not being many people do them. <laughs> my, my hat's off to Robert Frost. <laughs> next year, I'll give you, if we do this again next year, I'll give you the Japanese forms because uh, that's what I write. Haiku, Tonka, and uh, Renku. All right. Those are all medieval forms, too. Bob Scott, unmute yourself. Can't hear you yet. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, how did you get interested in this topic? How did you discover this topic? Very roundabout. It started, well, you know, because I sort of... Um, the job I got when we got out here was art teaching, and uh, I can remember I was doing a fifth grade art class, and I had a uh, an art lesson I was going to do it was all in the fall, and I was going to do leaf printing, and I looked down the lesson plan, and it said, uh, "Have them write some haiku to go along with it." And I said, "Okay, I can do that." Five seven five, you know. And what I realized is I had a lot of very beautiful leaf prints, and the poems were awful. So oh. I realized that I had to learn something about haiku. And I started learning and I got hooked. And uh, never did the lesson again, but uh, I am now a, an editor and a published haiku poet, won some awards and everything like that, quite active. And, um, and I also um, involved in others. There's a cluster of poem forms, medieval Japanese poem forms that are practiced very widely throughout the world in, in, in international English and other forms. And that's sort of a direction I went in. But then um, I took this uh, NEH poetry seminar, ooh, 2007, I think it was. And um, 
so I, it sort of took me back to things I hadn't looked at since college English lit. And this professor um, showed us guzzles. And so I was intrigued and I tried them before deciding, no, it's really not my thing, but they're fun. And I may try one the student, with the students at some point. Can you give us some idea of how vast this world is? Because uh, it's a world that, and the one I live in, is completely hidden. It's invisible. But it sounds like from what you're talking, uh, from what you've described, that it is actually a very substantial world of practitioners and enthusiasts and so on. Can you comment on that? Well, you know, in this day and age where we are right now with uh, social media companies so under fire, deservedly so, uh, online poetry is, uh, the flowering of online poetry and sharing uh, is absolutely amazing. Hmm. And it's international. Um, I can't quite speak to the Persian forms. One thing I will tell you is, you know, you go, um, this is not necessarily stuff that's stuck in libraries. You can do an awful lot of research online. So while I'm sort of here hogtied from school, and since I have a writing interest now, uh, um, I can do a fair amount of research at home. I can speak a little bit more to the size of the the uh, the world of Japanese poetry, and I'll go into in the fall if uh, God willing, and we're all back, and I'm still here to uh, deal with that one, um, I can show in detail where the Japanese forms came from. Wow. Um, but um, Japanese poetry, and there's a certain amount of overlap because a lot of people come to the Japanese forms uh, mm -hmm. from mainstream poetry, although I was told by a very eminent English poem, the poet that there's no such thing as mainstream poetry. Um, Japanese poetry, uh, let's see, um, huge co community throughout the United States, United Kingdom, Ireland, France, um, Germany, some in Russia, Italy, um, uh, Near East, there are no one who, a poet and a Palestinian poet in, who lives in Israel, um, Yemen, uh, India, <laughs> Good uh, Lord. Iran, uh, heading around the world, Australians, New Zealanders, and it's English is, of course, the big language, and there are Japanese who write English language haiku now, too. So, uh, so you know, it's a kind of a world on which the sun never sets. Yeah, yeah. Mostly these days on Facebook. Hmm. Linda? Wow. Could, could I ask you about the... the um, the Islamic poetry. Mm -hmm. Has that tradition carried all the way through constantly or is it a revival? You know, it's what you, uh, you know, I think there's the devil's in the details of that. The question is where you, uh, where you differentiate survivals from revivals uh, can take it. Um, I'm going to back up one word. You know, another thing that got me interested in this was, um, we used to have a, um, a middle school history textbook for seventh grade, and there was a page in it that was comparing the Japanese feudal system to the European. Mm. And just that one page of bringing the two into contrast with each other, both civilizations with castles, although the uh, construction is quite different, and also a military caste although the methods of armor and the methods of fighting are quite different. Um, so anyway, I've been sort of thinking about that ever since. And um, so Japanese poetry and literacy and the role of women in court poetry is totally the opposite from the West. But the interesting thing that I stumbled upon <clears throat> With this thing, I limited it to Persian poetry, but there was one that I stumbled on recently, um, which is somebody on Facebook posted a poem with an intricate rhyme scheme. And I've, I learned that if you just Google the rhyme scheme, A, B, A, B, or whatever, 
there will be somebody who has discussed it and Google will bring back to you which poem was being talked about just from the wow. Word of wow. So I Googled this one and what came back was a Zajal, which is an Andalusian uh, 10th, 11th, 12th century poetic form that was a popular vernacular form. And um, so, so where it came from, and this was another African-American, modern contemporary African-American poet who somehow or another found this rhyme scheme that's not quite like the French form fix. It's a little different, but it's distinct. And um, then, so there was, it turns out there was a very, very famous Andalusian poet who wrote in that particular rhyme scheme of Zajal, and he influenced uh, people when, when Andalusia collapsed and he left and they all went east. Um, it's the Zajal spread from Andalusia there and sort of became this uh, another addition to the seedbed of Arabic poetry. And then somehow or another, uh, one person picked it up. Oh gosh, what, I'm blanking because I'm talking right now. It was a, um, oh, it was, there's one poem in the poem in this exact rhyme scheme by the poet whose name escapes me now, who wrote, do you know the poem, Dulce et Decorum Est Pro Patria Mortis? World, uh, World War I, oh gosh, uh, Wilfred Owen, one mm. Wilfred Owen, I think it is. And so I was absolutely fascinated with that, but I couldn't make anything out of it. So I dropped Sajal. But what I realized about uh, Andalusian poetry is that, uh, and it stands out when you know something about Japanese medieval court poetry that, um, courtly love and the way Western and French medieval poetry is a poetry of the troubadour singing of a, uh, a lady who is distant, who may deign to give her favors or more likely withhold them. Uh, that's a trope that comes from Andalusian poetry. So oddly enough, Arabic <coughs> and European poetry are really pretty close in some respects. And yeah. Japanese is just a whole other thing. <laughs> Thank you. And thank you to all of our speakers. It's been a wonderful evening. And I will look forward to seeing you all on February the 15th for the Viking Longboats. Thank you. Good night.